There we go. We got one on Zoom and some Facebook, any Facebook watchers. But um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you all for coming to today's lecture, our Maritime Heritage Series, where we uh, try our best to create some educational opportunities for our guests uh, by way of these lectures or, or slideshows, if you will. Um, today's topic is the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Um, usually our Maritime Heritage Series are, are a little more, more frequent in the uh, off season, um, summertime. We do them. Uh, we're in the library here today. Um, we have a summer camp going on with uh, fish and fishing where children are practicing some cane pole fishing skills and learning about different fish in North Carolina. And we're gonna be doing some artwork too. Um, so we're here in our library. For those watching at home, you might notice a different background behind me. Um, I've actually got the laptop set up on a, uh, set of stairs that you use in the library to roll around. I don't know if there's an official name for it or not, but uh, nonetheless, thank you for watching at home as well. Um, I think I mentioned it, maybe not, this will be recorded and it'll be put up on our YouTube page uh, at a later date. So if you have friends that are missing it, you can uh, tell them about our YouTube channel where we have all of the last few years of these lectures uploaded and you can watch at your leisure. Um, and if you don't like my voice, you can even turn off the volume. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so what I tried to do was put together a presentation about, come on in folks, have a seat. And we got, we're a little different setting here today. Um, Shannon, thanks for joining us. Uh, <laughs> we're live streaming over the web. So we've got some folks maybe watching from the comfort of their own home. Um, but what I tried to do was put together some images and, and kind of tell this story on the history of the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. So let's go ahead and get started here. This one, this uh, picture kind of tell, tells a little story in itself. Um, you see the lighthouse in the background. That's the one that we're familiar with. That's the one that's still standing today. Uh, and then in the foreground of this image, we have the remains of a shipwreck, a wooden vessel that came up onto the beach of Core Banks during a storm, more than likely, and was destroyed. And those are the remnants that are left behind. So that the story that this tells is that you know that lighthouse was put there in order to help prevent those situations. It was an aid to navigation. Inevitably, ships could be disabled uh, or caught off guard or uh, messed up their navigating uh, through their charts and ended up there on the shoals at Cape Lookout. And that could still happen. Um, and it could still really happen today too. Ships still wreck. Uh, so let's uh, dive into this here, if you will. Here we are on the Atlantic seaboard and we'll zoom in or show you highlight where, where Beaufort is, where the red star shows up there on the map. Um, so if you think about the early years of our country and even before then, anything that was really moving from colony to colony or eventually state to state uh, was pretty much done by water for the most part. So if you were sending something from um, you know, up north New England to down south, uh, <clears throat> there we go. So maybe you were going from Philadelphia uh, to um, Charleston or Wilmington and you were headed back up here uh, to Baltimore or something. Um, you had to go around North Carolina's coast and those three capes that project out into the ocean. Uh, so you know, we, we knew in those early years that it was important to have some type of warning, some type of uh, aid to navigation, if you will. Here's a little zoom in and a satellite image where you can actually see Cape Lookout there near the center bottom of the image with the shoals protruding into the ocean. Uh, and the same with Cape Hatteras and the Diamond Shoals. Uh, well, Cape Fear is off of the image, but it had the same issue with frying pan shoals, those shallow sandbars that sometimes could be five, six feet deep and the sailing vessel 
could easily be grounded on them. So it was important to have lighthouses for mariners to figure out where they were and that they were getting close to land and that they needed to maybe alter their, their course um, so that you wouldn't have situations like this. And this is what up on the Outer Banks from a particular shipwreck, high and dry on the sand. Um, so I mentioned a little bit uh, about um, this lighthouse service that came to exist you know, in 1789, it's established. Uh, and in 1804, money is actually appropriated for a lighthouse uh, on, and the wording in the report was on or near the pitch of Cape Lookout, kind of meaning uh, close to the Cape Point and the Shoals. Um, and they kind of wanted it you know, on a high ground if possible uh, to make it more visible. The place names that you see out here were what were existed around that time. Uh, Washington and Bath and New Bern and uh, Roanoke. Uh, Reading actually became known as Elizabeth City later on in time. Uh, early spelling maybe of Swansboro, uh, but there's Beaufort there in the bottom center and again Cape Lookout. Um, the logo you see was the, the logo to the United States Lighthouse Service. Well, if you aren't already familiar with the history of the lighthouse at Cape Lookout, um, you, you may not know that there was an earlier structure before the one we have today. It was built in 1812. This was a drawing of what that first Cape Lookout lighthouse might have looked like. We don't have any photographs, at least to my knowledge, um, and I've uh, met with uh, interpretive rangers and historians with the National Park Service that, that manage Cape Lookout National Seashore, and they have come forth with any photographs either. Um, you know, people didn't have cell phones back then. You couldn't really snap a picture of the 1812 lighthouse, but it stood for quite a while to where pictures, you know, cameras existed and pictures could have been taken. Um, I have some specifics on it, how much it cost, but it was 104 feet in height. Uh, and it had in my little drawing at the bottom there, red and white horizontal bands. There was a, a brick tower on the inside, but you can see with the image on the left, those are actually depicting the, the uh, cedar shake siding, the wood exterior that was over the, the brick. Um, and it was not a cylindrical base to the tower. It was actually the octagon shape here that we see off to the right. And I guess my attempt there was to say those are red bricks that are on the inside and then wood on the outside. Uh, the, the early light source that was used uh, was this type of um, parabolic reflectors um, that were set up uh, with a lamp in front of each reflector. Um, so if you can look at the bottom image here, those would be a series of reflectors that were kind of all side to side in, in the the dish part was kind of like facing out um, and they were kind of set up there in this circle and then each one had a lamp in front of it. The oil lamp would have looked like this image on the left. Um, and then this picture here in the top kind of shows you like, all right, the focal point is where the lamp would have been. It would have, light would have been, um, you know, emitted there, bouncing off of the reflector and then shooting back out to project out to see so that mariners could uh, see the, the light. Visible about 16 to 18 miles, and that's dependent on weather conditions, fog, rain, uh, and maybe even humidity, <laughs> like this time of year, things that get pretty hazy. Uh, if I go to the overlook on the roof, I can actually see the lighthouse really good on a nice, clear, crisp, low hum humidity day when it's not so hazy. Uh, but then there's days where I can't see the tower at all. Um, How far is it from here to that? Oh, gosh. Uh, I want to say like maybe 12, 11 miles. Okay, I was going to say 12 or 11. Um, yeah. Uh, so, okay, and here's a little kind of a, another diagram here. So there was a lens in, in front that also helped project kind of magnified the light. 
Uh, I don't know if this was the particular setup for that early 1812 structure or not, but uh, later in 1856, a Fresnel lens was installed for projecting the light, not just an individual lens uh, and those parabolic dishes. This was a, a lens where the lights, the, the um, lamps were up inside of this lens. So they would be, it's, it's hollow in the middle, it's empty, they would be in there. Um, this was a series of glass prisms that were set in place with a metal frame. Uh, we have a Fresnel lens on display in the exhibit gallery, but it's not the um, uh, size that was in the lighthouse there, Cape Lookout. It's a much uh, smaller order, if you will, um, that the, the sizes were ranked from from uh, one to ten, uh, one being the biggest, um, or no, one, seven orders. I'm sorry, seven orders of light, uh, and first order being being the, the biggest uh, size. Um, so those prisms projected the light to make it visible. The next slide shows you the ones the one that we have on display, and that is a uh, fourth order lens. So it's one, two, three, four. So it's they actually shrink in the number as you go up. Um, and that came from a screw pile type lighthouse that, that you see in a picture there from Maryland Point on the Potomac River. Now that's not a picture of the Maryland Point lighthouse up uh, there on the Potomac. It's a, but it, that's what it might have looked like. Uh, I don't have a picture of the Maryland Point lighthouse, but we had those screw pile lighthouses in North Carolina. Well, in our internal waters, uh, the Pamlico Albemarle Sound region. Um, in the mouth of the Roanoke and Pamlico River, um, and even where Core Sound and Pamlico Sound meet. So those were, as you see, a light was inside of a cupola, the little, little structure there at the top of the house. Um, and when, when the title slide for my program today, Cape Lookout Lighthouse, it's actually really should be Cape Lookout Light Tower. You know, this to me is a true lighthouse. It's a, it's a house with a light on top. Someone actually lived in there, a head keeper and an assistant keeper, and they took care of the light to make sure it was on. It was actual house with the kitchen, living quarters with the light on top. So the light house, the structure that I'm talking about today, the big cylindrical tower is a, is a light tower. Nobody lived in it. They lived beside it. It wasn't a light house. It wasn't a house, it was a tower. Um, so if you wanna get specific like that, then. Yeah, maybe we should be talking about the Cape Lookout Light Tower, and I should change all the text on here to reflect that. Um, the interesting thing about the 1812 version was that because of the, the height um, and, and the you know, mariners were complaining, they were more likely to run aground looking for the lighthouse than it would to actually help them in their navigation. Uh, so they complained enough, I guess, and Congress appropriated funds for a new lighthouse or light tower at Cape Lookout um, in 1857. And the new style lighthouse would essentially be the model for all others built after it, including the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse at Buxton. So they might be taller, but that design was based off of Cape Lookout. Uh, and these drawings I got from the National Park Service, I think they even have them on their website, but it kind of shows you the architectural plan. Um, and there was a inner wall and then these connectors to an outer wall, a thicker outer wall. It's a tapered conical shape. And I put all the heights um, up there because there's a lot of them floating around. You start to read on the internet, how tall is the lighthouse? Well, it depends on where you're measuring it to. <laughs> the ground never, the ground's the same, the ground changes. And, and, uh, but we have some different choices. We could say 150 feet to, to the light itself, the focal point. 161 to the top of the roof over the tower, 163 to the little ball that's sitting on the roof, or 169 to the top of the little spire off of the little ball on top of the roof. And it becomes like you know, a little game of adding things up there. Um, it was the, sh the geography and the fact that that point, Cape Lookout Point on South Core Banks protrudes out into the ocean with sandbars extending 15 miles or so off of that point. So this dangerous headland, if you will. Early maps and charts of the area 
referred to Cape Lookout as promontorium tremendum, terrible promontory, a terrible point of land. That's how they kind of chose some of these locations. But that being said, they also chose them based on shipping activity because the earliest lighthouse that we had in North Carolina was at Ocracoke Inlet. If it's not a point of land, it's all inlets in North Carolina are difficult to navigate, but it was a lighthouse there because Portsmouth Village and Ocracoke Inlet was important for shipping and commerce and merchant ships. Uh, that's why that lighthouse was built there on Shell Island. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was actually set inside of the inlet. Um, and it was our first lighthouse in, in North Carolina. So here's some specifics on the second lighthouse there. Finished in 1859 for Cape Lookout. Uh, so I said 163 feet, but yeah, that depends on what, what you want to measure to. Uh, for, so the price went up a little bit from 1812, uh, now we're at 45,000, uh, round brick tower. The construction was supervised by uh, Lieutenant William Henry Chase Whiting from the Corps of Engineers in the US Army. Um, it had a day mark, meaning the color or indicating color or pattern was just red brick, 1859 red brick. Um, so that's why I had this little drawing to show, to kind of give you an idea of what it might've looked like. It didn't have black and white on it in its the early years of its life. Uh, here's a little rundown of some of that time period. Um, you know, shortly thereafter it was constructed, we had the Civil War. Um, 1861, Confederate government orders all lenses removed from coastal lighthouses and navigational beacons. Why did they do that? It would make it more difficult for Union uh, ships and, and the Navy to come down into and infiltrate these inlets and make it along our coast, uh, basically to, so they had trouble finding their way. That's why the navigational aids were um, kind of eliminated. Uh, in, but in 1863, at that point, Union forces install a lens into the, the Cape Lookout Tower. The Confederates took it out and moved it away. I think it went to Raleigh. Um, Union forces install a, a smaller lens, but it's still better than nothing, right? Um, 1864, the following year, Confederate forces, or at least sympathizers or saboteurs or something, we're not exactly quite sure, but they uh, sneak through Union lines and occupied Carteret County in an attempt to blow up the lighthouse. Now the Body Island lighthouse uh, that at the time was blown up. Uh, that was one way to get rid of the navigational aids. Um, hopefully someone's not trying to blow up the museum. I don't know what they're doing out there. I think they're having trouble slamming a door. Um, on the, if I had to guess. So, um, so these, these fellows sneak down along the Moose River, cross over at South River in Carteret County, make their way down um, uh, through where uh, I think Crow Hill Road is, stay the night at a farm, they might have hopped over to Harker's Island, and then over to Shackelford, and then they were there at the lighthouse. No, at the time, Barden Inlet didn't exist. That wasn't until 1933. So they could walk from Shackleford to the Cape Lookout Light Tower. Uh, and they put a bunch of, they, so there's Union ships all around. You know, Beaufort was occupied, Moorhead City was occupied, um, Newburn was. So uh, they, they sneaked through, they put a bunch of powder in the base of the tower. They kind of, I don't know what the lighthouse keeper was doing at the time. Um, if they kind of like, you know, had him be quiet if he was resisting or if he was like, whatever, I don't care. Um, or if he was like, yeah, do it, let's do it. I'm tired of filling that thing with oil and making sure the lens is clean. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, they, the story goes that they had to borrow some embers from the lighthouse keeper's fireplace in order to do this. It was in April of 1864. So it was, could have been a little chilly out there. That's all they had to means to keep warm was a fireplace and they, they borrowed some hot embers to ignite the coals because, it, I mean, the, the powder because they were having trouble. And obviously it didn't work. Uh, there was damage to the staircase and there was the, the glass, the, the force of the explosion did destroy some of the lens and the glass. Um, so it temporarily put it out of order, um, but it wasn't, uh, it took maybe four or five months 
and, and they had it repaired and, and were able to have it up and operate again. Uh, so the, in 1865, those lenses that were taken out in 61 were found in Raleigh and returned to the lighthouses. Uh, let's see, 1867, the original first order lens from Cape Lookout returns from New York after undergoing repairs in France from damage incurred during the removal and transport in 1861. Uh, 1873, uh, and this is out, kind of a side note, it's not necessarily related to the, to the war and, and the situation there, but the Lighthouse Board orders that distinctive day marks are painted on lighthouses. So now we won't see just a red brick tower. Um, so around that time period, this is the scene really. Uh, and the folks at the Park Service kind of shared this slide with me. It's been photoshopped, if you will. There was a picture uh, from the general time period with the original keeper's quarters, I think off to the right for the 1812 tower, some keeper's quarters for the 1859 tower. Uh, and they were both standing at the same time. We don't know specifically when that 1812 tower came down, but it was still there when the new one was finished. It eventually, in disrepair, I think, came down at some point. Um, so they needed to paint these towers so they, they could be noticed uh, during the day, maybe, and, and, and be picked out easily and say, oh, that's Cape Lookout, or oh, that's Body Island, or oh, that's Cape Hatteras. Um, you're sailing along during the day, the coast pretty much looked the same. You know, surf, beach, sand, sea oats, dunes, wax myrtles, sky. <laughs> so you throw a red brick tower on there and, the, and it all looks the same. You wouldn't know if you were at Hatteras or Cape Lookout. So they said, we need to paint them these day marks. That's where I'm getting with this. Um, was it diamonds or diagonal checkers? Everyone, some people, swear up and down that, oh, they painted the Cape Lookout Tower wrong. This diamond should have been at Hatteras because Hatteras marks diamond shoals. And it's not true. The folks at the Park Service showed me the documentation, the handwritten notes that said, you know, Cape Lookout is to receive diagonal checkers. But it's kind of like potato, potato, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe it's easier to paint the checkers if you diagonal them, but here we get the, the day mark or the paint scheme for the tower. It's painted periodically, again and again. It's a rough environment out there. Sometimes it gets sandblasted. It's being pelted with rain and hurricanes and uh, sleet and ice, sometimes snow. Uh, so the white looking diamonds are facing east and west. The black are facing north and south, and that can help you even navigate a little bit if you know the geography of the area. Um, all right, someone shared this picture with me. That's the Cape Lookout Light Tower in 1996 <laughs> during one of those periods where it was being repainted. So I guess first they did all primer and then they came back and put the black uh, <clears throat> pattern on there. So I thought it was kind of funny. It was like, yeah would throw you off if you weren't aware of what they were doing. So this is the Hatteras Tower, of course, completed in 1870, gets painted in 1873 to receive the black and white spiral bands. Um, but this, as I mentioned, was designed after the Cape Lookout one. It looks pretty similar. It's just a little bit taller, a little bit bigger. They can, they can brag about that if they want. Um, this is the one they moved. That was pretty impressive. The chimney company picked it up and moved it. It was about, you know, the ocean was encroaching on closer and closer to the base of the lighthouse over the years. And then, and it's a historical landmark and the park service said, we can, we're not just gonna let this, the tallest lighthouse in the country, you just can't let it fall in the ocean. Um, so they picked it up and moved it. All right, here's Body Island, completed in 1872. Uh, I think that was the, the third tower that was there. And this one still stands today. And I guess in 1875, when they finished the Kerala Lighthouse in Kurta, they must have run out of paint. Or, or all the other ones were gone. I didn't have to worry about this one. They just left it red brick. Um, if you haven't visited these lighthouses, I highly uh, encourage you to. Um, if you're adverse to tourist traffic, do so in the wintertime. 
this one, this one probably one of the longer ones to get to because it's a two lane road from Kitty Hawk all the way to Kerala. Uh, and the traffic can be pretty bad. Um, I, I've been talking about day mark, but what about the night mark or light pattern? In 1812, the early tower was a fixed light, fixed white light. Um, in 1914, we where we have um, visible 20 seconds, 10 seconds not visible. Um, and what, what that means was like, they had this device uh, that it's not that the light was going on and off. Remember these were lamps and they were lit. So the light keeper wasn't gonna light it and put it out and light it and put it out. And like, he, he kind of had more important things to do and get, light it and leave. And it had a wind up type mechanism that actually I think it lowered the lamps for 10 seconds and then it went back up for 20 seconds and then it went down you couldn't see it it wasn't shining through the lens and then it went back up so uh, that was the type of uh, device that they had set up in there by 1933 it's things are changing um, it's on for two seconds off for two on two seconds off nine seconds so at nighttime you couldn't see the, the paint day mark so now you need to if you're a ship captain you need to memorize the uh, night mark or the light pattern. A lot of nav navigational charts might have had this information on it for you um, to help you as you make your way along the coast. Uh, the current pattern, I think they've stuck with this is every 15 seconds, um, you see the light. And it, it, before uh, we had, and not too long ago, we had a rotating arrow beacon and I'll talk about that later. So it wasn't flashing then either. It was actually just rotating and as it went around at the right speed. It was every 15 seconds. Now uh, I'm pretty sure it's flashing, uh, but I'm going to go over that um, right now. Uh, so I made this little chart kind of because I, I like to geek out on this stuff. Um, the light in the house, the years on the left column, the fuel or power source, the, the lamp or bulb situation in the reflector and lens situation. Um, so I, I, did, I started with this, just the 1859 tower here. They, they would have used whale oil. Whales were harvested right there at Shackleford Banks and so were dolphins and oil was uh, rendered from the blubber. They would have used that. The lighthouse keeper would have to haul it up the steps. Um, and then you can see the progression. Um, there's the uh, 1933 or 1975, the two, DCB 24 inch aero beacons are installed. And I'm pretty sure those are types of lights that they would have in airports that you see kind of going back and forth. Or I kind of remember it from the Charlie Brown Christmas special when he's going out to get the Christmas tree and you see the lights in the background and him and Linus head off to the, the you guys are like, <laughs> this is, I'm crazy, I know. <laughs> but just trying to, you know, the lights are doing like that. Well, this now they're in the lighthouse and they're, they're spinning around. Um, all right, so what we got here, um, power source, diesel generators in 1970, 1933, 1983, an underwater electric cable. Well, that cable is starting to go out, and instead of replacing it, um, you know, they said, what else can we do for this light, to keep the light going? That's the main reason the tower's there. Um, and they actually did do a solar panels, and I, I created this lecture. It was one of the first ones when I started here at the museum 10 years ago. And I created this lecture. And this is what I had. I question marks because I was trying to guess the future. What are they gonna do? I don't know, it's probably gonna change. Well, it did. Two years ago, they put the solar panels up and then, and then uh, they got the uh, LEDs in. So I was right on those two. And now then I was thinking, I was getting kind of crazy because I am like, oh, maybe they'll put some diamond reflectors in there and really project it out there. But I don't really know the reflective property of diamonds. I just really have an experience with one diamond and it's the one I got for my wife when I proposed. Um, other than that, I don't know much about. Uh, anyway, let's move along here. because. Uh, so what happened to that first order Fresnel lens that was removed in 1976 to put in those aero beacons? Uh, it goes up to... Uh, Coast Guard Support Center in Portsmouth, Virginia until 1994. So it's basically, I think it was kind of sitting in a warehouse 
and then it's transferred to the Block Island Southeast Lighthouse in Rhode Island. So that's where it is right now. How do we get our first order lens back? Can we work out some kind of deal where we trade something with them? We don't know. I'd like to see it back here. Maybe not, they won't think they'll put it in a tower, but maybe they could put it at a park service visitor center at Harker's Island or something. Uh, maybe it will come back someday. Uh, you know, I've been talking about the tower itself, but you know, there's people associated with this history. There was a head keeper and also assistant keepers and their families that lived right there and had to make sure that the light was going. It was like Motel 6, we'll leave the light on for you. We'll make sure it's on all the time. Um, and here are their names for, for some of that time period. Uh, and a lot of these are local names, Fulford and Royal and Chadwick and Mason and Davis. Um, you know, so those were people that were living in the community and got employed with the US Lighthouse Service. And they probably saw some pretty wild weather out there. The hurricane 1876 had flooded the base of the lighthouse and the first floor of the keeper's quarters, I think, um, washed completely over core banks. 1933 is when the inlet opened, Barden's Inlet. Here's a little drawing uh, that a former museum staff did, Connie Mason. Uh, and I talked with Ira Lewis, the late Ira Lewis from Harker's Island. And I just wanted to put like these place names up here. There were people living all along Shackleford Banks. The little star denotes where the lighthouse was. And these were names of communities or at least uh, family uh, communities that existed. Um, everybody likes to talk about Diamond City. Uh, you know, it was probably originally known as Lookout Woods or just the village on the East End. Diamond City didn't come until one <laughs> after the lighthouse was painted because there weren't any diamonds around <laughs> to really get that nickname. Um, so that would have been after 1873 and then Two, it wasn't, it wasn't until a visiting superintendent of the life-saving service came to check out and see what was going on with the life-saving station out here, the predecessor to the Coast Guard, and the lighthouse had been painted, and he kept referring to Lookout Village or the village there or Lookout Woods as Diamond City. He's like, oh, I'm going to go over to Diamond City and get something from the general store or whatever. Um, and supposedly that's how the name stuck. But you had other places... Um, Sam Windsor's lump. Sam Windsor was someone there that lived there with his family. Tyree Moore's camp. Uh, so that was his crew. Ed Moore's point. Joe Lewis's neighborhood. Um, and then there's the Mullet Pond down there on the West End. So that's all Shackleford Banks, 1850 to 1890. And it's connected here to Core Banks. Uh, there's Rec Point. That's the name of that little piece. Pardon me? No, no, no. Uh, local. Um, from Carteret County. Good question though. You never know. So there's uh, Harker's Island, Beaufort. Um, okay. So I mentioned the, those people, who they were, where they came from. Uh, what did they have to do? Well, they had to keep the light operating. Uh, typically from 4 p.m. to dawn or 24 hours a day during bad weather. Uh, keep, this meant keeping the lamps filled and the wicks trimmed. Uh, at least prior to 1933, carrying five uh, to 10 gallons of oil up 200 stairs to the top of the lighthouse. That would have been difficult. The wind up mechanism that rotated the lamp from that, for that time period then. Um, clean and polish the lens and the outside windows, uh, regular chores, tending the gardens. This was a sustenance type lifestyle. There was the store over at Diamond City, if you will. Um, but a lot of people back then were living a sustenance type lifestyle, living off the land and the water uh, and whatever gardens and fruit trees and you know, chickens or hogs and stuff like that that they had. Uh, the average pay was about $300 a year until 1867. And then uh, gradually it would re increase up to $600 a year. Uh, this was steady employment for somebody. Your fishing was, could be unreliable depending on the season, depending on uh, you know, environmental conditions and um, storms and such. Uh, but keeping the lighthouse was pretty stable, stable employment. Um, this is what the view would look like if you were the lighthouse keeper and you went up to the top. Uh, we know now that they 
uh, periodically the tower is open for climbing by the public. Currently, it's not. The doing renovations, you know, towers are over 150 years old. So they got to make sure that it's safe to climb. Uh, and even then, you know, when you get to the top, you have to go through this little opening and then you're out there on the railing. This is a picture that I snapped probably 10 years ago, maybe more, um, looking out to the ocean on the east side of Core Banks there. You could see the boardwalk that exists that gets you from the, the dock and the, um, the little uh, gift shop and building that exists. So some other things that were going on in, in the area of the lighthouse during the time, I mentioned the life-saving station. Uh, this was the first station that we see in this picture, built in 1887. The crew is posing for this picture. There they are. They got tired of standing. The cameraman must have been taking too long and they're all sitting down there on the ground. Uh, there's their surf boat that they could use to row out the shipwrecks and save people. Here's the, the uh, apparatus cart that had the Lyle gun and the faking box, the powder charges, everything they would need to set up if they needed to use the breaches buoy. There's their little lookout tower. They would look for ships day and night. They also walked the beat and did foot patrol on the beach. Um, and there's the lighthouse way back there. So you can see the change in the land with the vegetation it was pretty blank. If you stood at this location today, which is the, the, this building's been moved since 1887, but uh, it was moved, um, I guess, in 1915 or, or a little bit later, maybe. Um, <clears throat> But there's been trees that have grown up. There was actually trees planted around the lighthouse. Um, some trees just came up naturally with succession, uh, but you can't really see it from standing where, where this point is today. Uh, so here's the, here's the lifesavers <clears throat> headed out to the beach, probably doing a practice drill. They had to practice uh, with something every day with the, the lifeboat. And the, Reaches buoy, uh, life resuscitating skills. <clears throat> Here's what the grounds of the, around the, the area looked like in 1893. By that time, the 1812 tower is gone, but the keeper's quarters, the original structures there. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's the keeper's quarters behind the 1859 tower. Again, pretty barren, nothing, no vegetation out there. You can imagine how easy it would be for the storm surge to sweep across the, uh, <coughs> the island. So 1873 quarters is what you see there. There was a previous structure that um, isn't, isn't, wasn't in that picture. Uh, in addition to the light tower, we had a, a light ship anchored out on the shoals. So the light towers were great and it helped people navigate and it warned them about Key Lookout Point, but because those shoals changed and were so shallow, um, you know, they had the, the lighthouse service had the idea, let's put a ship even farther out than the lighthouse can, can project its light to he really help you know, sea captains and the mariners. So this ship was anchored off the end of Cape Lookout Shoals and it sat there bobbing up and down <laughs> and people were stationed on it. Uh, you can see them, barely see them in the image. There they are, they're posing for the picture too. Um, but they had the lights on that ship. They, were, they had to keep on. They also had a fog horn or a fog bell to ring that in poor visibility. So they'd be out there taking shifts for weeks at a time and they'd go back for a week or so and then go back out there. They'd get their mail delivered, their supplies were delivered, their food. I would not be able to handle that. <laughs> if you're prone to motion sickness, it wasn't the job for you. I would rather have been working at the, the lighthouse. Um, so here we see several different structures uh, for, for keepers quarters there. In this 1913 image, the 1873 one, uh, a 1907 um, keepers quarters. I think we had a, the fuel or this might've been a, kitchen, uh, maybe fuel stables. 
they probably were assigned at least a mule, um, but they could have had a horse too. Uh, nearby, down the way by the life saving station, which merged with the revenue cutter service in 1915, uh, now is a Coast Guard uh, and they get a new Coast Guard station finished in 1917. So the early station was decommissioned and eventually moved and became a private um, residence and building. So I talked about Varden's Inlet, 1933 September hurricane that creates the inlet there. Uh, here's Cape Lookout Point. So Core Banks, Varden Inlet, and Shackelford Banks, the lighthouse in here. Um, so in this aerial photo from 1940, that's only seven years af after the storm that opened it. That's why the, the inlet looks so narrow. Uh, a lot of the land has eroded since then, and it's a little bit wider now. Here's a 1950 shot from the Core Bank side. So there's Barton's Inlet and Shackleford Banks. Here's the keeper's quarters, head keeper, assistant keeper. It might even sometimes had two assistant keepers. Some, one period, the weather service had a signal officer stationed there and actually lived in the keeper's quarters. He took weather data and information and was responsible for weather signals and flags for the boats in the vicinity of the lighthouse to warn of a bad weather. He took records on wind speeds and rain. And I think eventually he was responsible for the wire, the wire uh, signal system that they used. I think you can see maybe those are the, the towers for communication that we see there. I could be wrong. I need I'm not 100% on that one. So there's 1873, 1907. Now this structure, this keeper's quarters building was actually decommissioned at some point and sold and moved by barge down the inlet and uh, put back up on land. You can go see it today. People refer to it as the Barden House. I think it was a commissioner or somebody that bought it and his name was Barden. Um, and maybe that's why they named the inlet after him because he moved the house through it. He was the first one to move a house through the inlet or something. I don't know. Sometimes that's how inlets got named. Oregon Inlet was named for the first ship to come through the inlet. Relocated in 1958. There we go. All right. uh, this is probably the same shipwreck that I had in my title slide, just a color image. Um, and we had some changes take place in the lighthouses or light towers weren't as important as they used to be for aids to navigation. Today, they help, you know, you, people, you can still use them. Doesn't mean that they don't work anymore, but you know, there's all these other things that we can rely on. Not more advanced nautical charts, you know, not as many people are out there anyway with commerce and, and, and uh, passengers going up and down the seaboard. All that's changed and come on land by rail or highway, interstate. Uh, intercoastal waterway was a big shift to get to prevent these shipwrecks from happening. More powerful ships that didn't rely on the weather, um, the navigating equipment. Um, so I just did this little bullet list of um, who was managing that that lighthouse. I, I mentioned the you know, U.S. Lighthouse establishment. Um, for there was a period there where the U.S. Revenue this is in 1790, the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service starts. Um, so I added some notable events in there. Uh, 1852 becomes known as the U.S. Lighthouse Board. Uh, 1871 is when U.S. Life Saving Service is established. 1910, it becomes the Bureau of Lighthouses or the U.S. Lighthouse Service. 1915, uh, that's when we get the U.S. Coast Guard. But it wasn't until 1939 that the lighthouses, the lighthouse um, service joins with the Coast Guard. Um, in 1966, this was notable, Shackelford and Core Banks become Cape Lookout National Seashore. Uh, in 2003, the Cape Lookout Lighthouse and its associated buildings are transferred to the National Park Service from the U.S. Coast Guard, but the, but the Coast Guard is still responsible for the light maintenance though, and then that one eventually changed too. Um, 
So there's the logos there. That's the revenue cutter service. That's the life saving service. That's the lighthouse service. And then they become, then they're all part of the Coast Guard. And now that one is part of the Cape Lookout National Seashore, which is the National Park Service. And here's the image showing the boardwalk. When you take the ferry over, um, you can walk out to the lighthouse. If it's open for climbing, you go up top. There's a museum set up in the Keeper's Quarters building. It talks about what it was like to be the keeper and some natural history information as well. Or you could take the boardwalk out to the beach and enjoy the ocean. I highly recommend that visit. And when it's open to climbing, if you're not worried about heights, I, I suggest it, it's pretty cool. This was a different perspective. So we can see the 1917 Coast Guard Station. There's the Barden House. It used to be a keeper's quarters that was moved from here. And then the life-saving station of the 1870s is somewhere in here. And it still stands. And I think the Park Service is finally starting to get some money to restore it. Uh, they're responsible for these, these buildings here. These buildings were privately owned in, in the 60s when it became a national park. There was agreements that said, all right, you can uh, retain ownership for a certain number of generations. And then it becomes park service land and we try to preserve it and um, if it's a historical structure and so that people can uh, learn about it um, you know there was the deal was if you could produce a deed or you know title or something that said that that land was yours and some people couldn't they just had always gone out there for fishing camps and summer summer uh, houses and they just put them there um, or it had family there for generations and you know it was just known that hey that was that's where they lived uh, and they lost their their property right away so some maybe some hard feelings on their behalf um, so I ended with just the sunset shot uh, south of the Cape Lookout Tower there uh, give some credit to my image sources and information um, I highly recommend you visit it if you haven't, or if you have a good excuse, as always, if you have friends or family that come to town, go out there. If you got your own boat, definitely go out there. Uh, there is a ferry that runs to the light tower as well for a good part of the year. Um, that's what I have for my presentation. Thank you all for watching online. Thank you all for coming. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them. Otherwise, enjoy your visit to the museum today and come back uh, for our next uh, event, which is a maritime movie in, in the coming weeks. Coming, we have one in July about uh, fishing community and Steeds Ferry. Wild caught. So, now it'll be an auditorium. Yes, one question in the back. There's still a lot of like structures out there, and if you go to what's called Hot Bar and like when you're coming from the front of Shack, Onsel Bay, coming in that way, there, there's still like structures, and, and what what are all those? Like, it looks like there's a dock there. Yeah, that's an old Coast Guard dock. Um, okay. And so if you follow that, get on there, follow the the road, it leads right up to that uh, station. Um, but you may see some other buildings in here. Uh, this one here, that was a private residence, the summer cottage. Um, same with these here and this green one and this one. Uh, and like I said, this was decommissioned and became private. Uh, there were some out by the water were private. There was a, a big one that was on the water for a while. They, they called it the Casablanca House, but it slowly deteriorated and fell to pieces. And there's nothing left of it. But uh, if, if, I think those maybe are what you're talking about. So are, are those still, are, do people still use those? No, I think that they, that agreement from the 60s where they said you had a certain number of generations that is, it expired uh, and they've reverted to um, park service property of federal so, so if we would traverse from 
one side, you could definitely go and see some of these. Yes. You know, they're probably dilapidated. Some of them are, yeah. They're not particularly historic structures, so the Park Service uh, is not concerned with maintaining a, a structure that's not historic. The keeper's quarters that was moved is, and they've been trying to fix it up and take care of it. The life-saving station from the set 1870s is historic and they're working on fixing it up. The Coast Guard station is historic and the outbuilding where they had vehicles and horses and stables and kitchen is historic and they're going to maintain it as well as the keeper's quarters that still exist at the lighthouse. Uh, is there any uh, natural path that goes from um, you know, the, the lighthouse side to the other side to get to those buildings? Is there any kind of natural Yeah, well, you can walk the shoreline and you'll end up down here and then there's a road that winds through around these structures and then up to the uh, Coast Guard Station, and then it turns and goes all the way down to that dock. There is a back road that the trucks use that um, also comes down and has a spur that comes off and connects to this road. Uh, and then it, and it, I think it continues and goes out towards the point as well after going through the that. Some people refer to it as Cape Lookout Village. But it, I mean, it wasn't really good. It was a bunch of summer cottages and summer homes. Um, so it seems like it was a village, but it wasn't really, compared to Diamond City, it wasn't really, it didn't have the uh, uh, general store or the uh, church and stuff like Diamond City did. Where is Diamond City? Well, it's in the inlet. <laughs> uh, but that, it was long disbanded. Uh, 30 some years before that hurricane, um, the people living there and the residents had kind of had enough of the storms. But at the same time, if you, you know, those pictures where we saw the core banks and what it looked like, the you know, vegetation was sparse and they relied on timber for you know, building houses and building boats and firewood and building fences or whatever. Um, and as the the, maybe any early uh, maritime forest and trees that were available on Shackleford and in the area were depleted to the point where they got tired of going over to the mainland just to get timber and then come back. So that could have been another reason to prompt people to move off of Shackleford and go to places like Parker's Island and Beaufort and Moorhead City to the promised land, if you will. Uh, and some went to Salter Pass. They just went to a different island that traditionally did not have a lot of people living on it. That's both banks. Well, I'm sorry, I've been out less. That's no, no problem. So I, I know that um, our neighbor has told us about a cemetery that is on Shack. We, we've never yes. found it. Are there any cemeteries um, on um, the Cape Lookout Island? Yeah, not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, the, the, the core banks run, running north in this picture, um, was much less desirable for settlement because of the flatness of it. If you've ever walked through parts of Shackleford Banks, and I su suspect that originally at Lookout Village or Diamond City, there was more topography. Um, but walking through some sections of that island, the dunes may have been higher and it may have been more protected, might have been safer from storm surges, whereas Core Banks. Uh, you know, as far as most record keeping goes, was pretty much always relatively flat. There weren't many sand dunes. And so storm surges easily just washed over the island, not really making it conducive to setting up a little village, therefore not having any residents and nobody being buried. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't something there. As the park service, as you know, doesn't have any information on it, but but the village on the extreme north end of the seashore, Portsmouth Island, was a much larger village than Diamond City ever was. It wasn't really on Core Banks; it was on Portsmouth Island, and they were, you know, attached by tidal flats and marshes. They could you could get out to the beach, and you could drive out to the beach or walk out to the beach, but it was back more in the Pamlico Sound 
side of the island. Um, and there are cemeteries there. There are still structures there. There are uh, still houses there. Nobody lives there anymore. Last person to leave was in the 1970s, um, but it was a much more established city in uh, the Diamond City with church and a post office and a general store and schoolhouse and uh, the life-saving station for Ports the Portsmouth station was right there as well. Uh, so yeah, they, they the ferry is the easiest way, but first you got to get to Okoko. Yeah. <laughs> so go to Okoko first. And and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it, I, su I suggest a winter visit yeah. uh, if you can and if the ferry's running and still take your bucks break because they're even there in the winter. It doesn't matter, but you're usually not as bad if the wind's blowing hard enough and it's cold enough it might subdue them a little bit but it's a lot easier to get there from Ocracoke. Um otherwise you could take your private boat your own boat if you have one or you'd have to take the ferry from Atlantic over to North Core Banks and then drive or hike uh the Howard seven or eight or so miles all the way up to Portsmouth if the beach is intact. Uh, we know anytime there's a storm or hurricane, I think uh, maybe it was um, Florence, there might've been like 11 inlets open temporarily <laughs> or something on core banks. So that means that water had cut through the island <laughs> in multiple different places. <laughs> so you can't drive uh, through it. Um, and as the inlets are always kind of changing and doing that. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll coach your best bet. So. I'm, I'm going to find that over here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you want to find this interesting. It's the original D. Well, oh. only relatives uh, sold the land to the government. Okay. To build a lighthouse. Awesome. Well, the, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Here's Is this for me? Wow. And uh, what my, my heirs did also is they looked ahead. Yeah. And said that we have like uh, lifetime fishing rights oh, out there goodness. for eternity. Yeah, that was a good idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, well, thank you for bringing that yeah. in and thank if you for you sharing. More information, let me give you my wife's email address. Yeah, definitely. Because she's a uh, genealogy, okay. aggravating the living, and disturbing the dead. Well, I appreciate you sharing. Oh, sure. I always love it. Uh, Sure. Thank you all for coming. Nice to to you. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? You sure can. <laughs> so, if, if I, I'm where is um, Beaufort from that lighthouse? To it would be out of the picture to the left. To the left. Uh -huh. So, if I'm coming in my boat, Shackleford Island would be on the left, right? Yes. Yeah. I'll get, I'll bring out that, so big, yeah, that other picture. It's going to help you. Right. Um, because when we went with, I, I, we've been to the papers, uh, we've been to the things that are right on the shore. We've been to the museum and we've been back to the little gift shop. And I've always asked them, uh, but they've never talked about, you know, the, the restoration of the lifesaver station and how to find it. So I'm, I'm just curious how to find it. Yeah, it will be south of the lighthouse and south of that visitor center. On, on the island, that oh. little gift shop, and yeah. where you get water and snacks and uh, toys. <laughs> so. So, I was just gonna, I just pulled up this map to kind of show you the relation here. Oh, there's Beaufort up to the upper left. Okay. There's Fort Macon in the picture, Beaufort Inlet. Um, the, there's, I guess they call the, uh, in the hook there. So this is where Barden's Inlet would be, and you know, there's the lighthouse. Okay. So you can get the ferry from Harker's Island, it'll take you right there. The ferry from Beaufort takes you too, but it's longer. <clears throat> from the lighthouse, just direct me to where the light, the save, the light saving station. If you could go to that, back to that map, please. The, the one that I just had up? Yeah, the one you just Yeah, had. sure. I just want to make sure. You just go south. It'd be right down here where this little star is. And it's on the other side. That's why we don't see it by water here. It's, it's, it's really kind of kind of in the middle of the island. Yeah. Um, I think I think the shoreline was different when they first built 
the life-saving station in the 1870s. The shoreline has changed on both sides. Erosion and accretion happens naturally on these barrier islands, it's just sand. So, so at one point it might have been closer to the water and then this beach grew and it became farther uh, on one side. Um, it may have got a little closer on the other side. This one's, yeah, so that's the east end of Shackleford Banks right there. Yep. Yep. And the locals call it the drain because it drains all the water out of back and core sound at low tide. Low tide, the water comes out the end. You know, some so for a long time, some people just call it the drain. It's like you pull the drain and low tide happens and core sound, the water comes out. Where are the cabins? Pardon me? Where are the cabins? Uh, the fishing cabins are, yeah, they would be north okay. off the picture here. So you have to think of Cape Lookout core banks being separated. You have a south core and a north core banks. And now you, I mean, it might be an island in the middle, I don't know what they call it, but it's between Drum Inlet and New Drum Inlet and Old Drum Inlet. But anyway, the cabins for south core are at the north end of it. So you leave from Davis and you go to the fishing cabins that the Park Service maintains and they have a concession. Um, and there's a host that you can help you get ice and they run on generators. Uh, and then there's cabins on North Core Banks. They're on the south end of North Core Banks. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, I don't have a good image up on here right now, but um, for that in my slideshow, but that to get to the, the cabins on North Core Banks, you leave from Atlantic. That's the one that I mentioned will take you to North Core Banks if you have a vehicle, four wheel drive, then you can get to Portsmouth, but it's a lot easier. You know, it's harder to just ferry it over. If the Park Service has a welcome center on Front Street. You can get, maybe at least pick up one of their detailed brochures and maps. Um, it might have a little more information in it. I'm not sure, we don't have one in our foyer, do we, for the National Seashore? I don't think, yeah, I don't think we do, but they're down on Front Street in the old post office by Graydon Paul Park, and uh, they, they can give you a brochure and not even answer more of your questions, but um, they have a pretty detailed map of the places anyway. Uh, I don't think it zooms in like I did with that, that image. Um, no, that was yeah. true. I took pictures of it, so very, okay. very helpful. So Great. That's going to be our mission. The other mission we have is when we go out to Shack is to find that mullet pond. We, we search for that, but we can't find that. Yeah, so, it's confusing because, you know, um, there's a little tidal area there. Some people, I think, call, mistakenly call that the mullet pond, but I don't think it was. Um, I think the mullet pond has become more uh, isolated and with vegetation around it and it's become more fresh uh, because of sand maybe filling it in where it connected to the sound um, so I don't think that uh, you know but I, I could be wrong I mean I haven't found any definitive map that says that's the mullet pond yeah. uh, but I haven't I haven't really completely exhausted my search yet so I still might find something yeah so so if she if she says that then she's referring to the one the, 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 the you know what I'm talking about that got cut off from the sound mm -hmm. the, the sand filled it in the mouth so the, the pond still stayed it became more fresh and it's surrounded by vegetation. So it's hard to see hard to and it's hard to get to. So my advice is there's the dock, the park service dock there by the little bathrooms yeah. and the rock jetty. Yeah. If you're standing in front of the bathrooms, follow the trail to the left, mm -hmm. but that trail branches off again. So kind of keep staying to the left. Don't walk along the shoreline. Kind of keep staying to the left. And you'll be like, you're gonna walk into the woods eventually after going up and down some dunes, but, but there was a little, from where I, when I last time I did it, there was a little trail that went through the trees and there was the mother pond. Keep in mind, it's full of vegetation, yeah. freshwater grasses and, and stuff. So it's not like this open pond oasis. Yeah. It might sound like 
Is there water in it? Yeah, especially when it rains a lot. Is there mullet in it? No, I don't think so. Is there frogs? Yeah, probably. Do the horses drink out of it sometimes? I'm sure they do. The water's there. But it looked, it was really thick and clogged with vegetation. The, the last time I saw it, it's been a few years. Uh, okay. The other thing is just a cemetery. Yeah, and that's back in the, that one's better accessed from walking the shoreline. So if you're at the dock, they're left on the shore, <clears throat> you keep walking, and you'll kind of get to this point. You look on my drawing here, this is indicating Middle Marsh. Middle Marsh is just salt marsh area, um, but it's kind of between Beaufort and Harker's Island, and it's pretty close up to the backside of Shackleford. So when you get off of, <clears throat> when you're walking along here, and you line up with this side of the marsh, middle marsh, then you're kind of in the vicinity of the graveyard. Okay. It's slowly getting closer and closer to the water because the land is eroded and getting closer and closer to the graveyard. Uh, it's not a big graveyard. There weren't a lot of stones there. And it too was grown over as well. There was a Boy Scout troop, I think, that had a project where they marked it off and cleared it and put rope, a little rope fence around it. I don't know if that still stands. Um, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, the bigger cemetery would have been at Diamond City, yeah. um, which a lot of that, that's pretty much all washed away. And, and the inlet, and, you know, I don't know, it'd be interesting if. Anything, anything washed up. But I talk to people too that say, oh yeah, my, my family was from Shackleford. We have, you know, great granddaddy's whale gun. And I'm like, you do? <laughs> I want to see it. I don't want to, I don't want to take it from you, but I want to see it. Because <laughs> uh, you know, that's where the whaling communities were, the fishing communities. And, you know, so there's people in the area and some people are kind enough to come and yeah. share information with me. And uh, well, my relatives came down from Cape May, and they did well off of here. See, yeah. and everything. So that provided the well oil for the lighthouse. Yeah. And then later on, they went down to Beaufort County. Okay. And it's pickets and fulfers and tab tablets down there. Too. Okay. So, yeah. That. Yeah. There was a lot of uh, promotion of the area to folks from New England, like. Mm -hmm. Even some of the maps of the time period show whales off of North Carolina. Yeah. Like, you know, the, a lot of the whalers originated from. Well, they only had to kill one whale a year. <laughs> yeah. And they made enough money. And it, it, it definitely yeah. helped with the income. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this was very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, thanks thanks for, you for coming. Me ask so no problem. Glad you joined. And so thanks for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>